The world is divided into four spheres, each sphere divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Minds. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Chris Spanos. Coming up on the show, critics have long pointed out that the social media phenomenon of the selfie is rooted in vanity and narcissism. But scholar and cultural critic Henry Guru says it's about much more. I'll speak with Henry. But first, a look at news on Latin America. The media industry is rattled over NBC's unprecedented suspension of anchor Brian Williams after the revelation of a series of embellished accounts of his own reporting. But over at The Nation magazine, Latin America expert Greg Grandin pointed to another news anchor, Bill O'Reilly at Fox News. Like Williams, O'Reilly also has a history of embellishing war reporting. Grandin suggested that O'Reilly may have even helped cover up the December 1981 El Mazote massacre in El Salvador, where U.S. trained soldiers killed between 733 and 900 villagers. While working as a foreign correspondent for CBS Nightly News in early 1982, O'Reilly traveled to El Salvador to cover an alleged leftist killing near the site of El Mazote. O'Reilly described the scene, writing, quote, the place was leveled to the ground and fires were still smoldering. But even though the carnage was obviously recent, we saw no one live or dead. There was absolutely nobody around who could tell us what happened. Grandin located the video broadcast of O'Reilly's report and identifies a number of problems with how O'Reilly tells the story in his book. Among the discrepancies that Grandin pointed out, the town wasn't leveled, most of the town seemed to be intact, no smoldering fires were seen, and where O'Reilly claims to have seen no one, alive or dead, Grandin counted at least eight people who looked like residents of the town going about their daily business. Grandin asks, did O'Reilly intentionally deflect away from a war crime that implicated Reagan's Central America policy, or was the deflection a result of his ignorance or laziness? It may be wishful thinking to hope that Fox give O'Reilly, at the very least, the Brian Williams treatment. Everywhere, people are taking selfies. There are over 23 million Instagram photos with the hashtag selfie, and a staggering 51 million with the hashtag me. Critics observe that pop stars such as Rihanna, Justin Bieber, Lady Gaga, and Madonna are all serial selfie takers. And the word selfie, the social media phenomenon of taking a picture of yourself, is currently being monitored for inclusion in the Oxford Dictionary Online. Henry Guru is professor at McMaster University and author of many books. He was a 20-year collaborator with the Brazilian educator and philosopher Paulo Freire. Henry joins me to discuss the selfie phenomenon. Hi Henry, welcome to Imaginary Lines. I'm delighted to be here. Tell me about the rise of the selfie in contrast to the privacy that people once valued. Well, I, I, I think they sort of operate in contradiction in some ways to each other. In that, at one level, there's an enormous concern about the rights, pride, the rights of privacy, uh, particularly around the growing, the growing uh, nature of the surveillance state. But at the same time, they, people live under a market-driven society. M many people, for whom the question of privacy really is nothing more than a space to be commodified. And I think that what often happens is that people can't exit from the private fast enough, in order to display themselves in some performative way on a whole range of social media. And what they don't realize is the degree to which they're giving up and surrendering and becoming complacent in the face of a state that wants to garner as much personal information about them as possible. How does the selfie phenomenon fit in the context of surveillance, the state and corporations? I mean, I, I think that what you have, particularly in the United States, but clearly also in a whole range of other countries as well, you, you have the merging of at one level, the state intelligence agencies and the corporations in ways in which they not only engage in massive and multiple forms of surveillance with the corporate state, they're often concerned about, you know, all kinds of things that would relate to, to, to the market, what people buy and so forth and so on. But they also are concerned with protest movements 
And what they often do is they trade information with the federal government about who these protesters are. As you know, for the government here in the United States, they're collecting information on everything. I mean, there simply is, are no bounds, whether we're talking about your telephone conversations, your email, any form of digital telecommunications is now under siege, it seems to me, both in the United States and abroad. And I, and I think that the utter privatization being pushed by the market in, in some way has nothing to do with protecting the rights of privacy. It has every, it's a double bind, right? It says at one level, you basically have to live your life alone. You're responsible for yourself. Nothing else matters. All that matters is self-interest. At the same time, it says that self-interest is the only thing that should be placed or projected into the public sphere. Be confessional. Tell stories. Talk about your love life. You know, show pictures of yourself. Uh, so the public sphere becomes a kind of narcissistic mirroring of, of the kind of self-interest that now in some way collapses the public into the private. In your recent article, Rethinking the Self in the Age of the Selfie, you write that what is new about all this is the normalization of surveillance as people get more pleasure out of using these technologies. Explain what you mean by this. Oh, I, I mean, I mean these, these technologies basically uh, define themselves as a form of communication and entertainment. But, but really what they are, uh, for the most part, is, is a, a technologies that are tracking at almost every moment what people do. And since people buy into these technologies within a kind of orbit of privatization in which they rarely talk about real public issues, but they talk about their babies, they, you know, they, they, they put pictures of themselves up endlessly, they say things like, hi, I'm going to the bathroom now, I'll be back in five minutes. I mean, it's mind-blowing. I mean, they, they have become a virtual representation of the Catholic confessional. And I, and I, and I, and I think they, they, they're, they're an incredible testimony to the collapse of public issues into private lives, where the private becomes the only mode of agency that one can speak to, particularly in terms of one, the most private of one's interest. I mean, what goes online today, uh, I think it's just mind blowing. I mean, it, it's trivial, it's silly, it doesn't have to do with anything. And it's not about reaching out to people and saying, hey, look, let's talk about things that matter. It's, it's, it's reaching out to people and saying, hey, look at me, aren't I great? Look what I do all day. I mean, it's sort of a, you know, it's a prison of, of narcissistic self-interest. You're placing self-interest in a deeper context. How are we to make sense of the more general critique of the vanity and narcissism in this phenomenon? That's a, that's a terrific question. And I think one way of understanding it is this. Look, under a market-driven society, in a market-driven society, where I would call a neoliberal fundamentalist society, I mean, what you have are emerging sets of values that basically are legitimized by this, this and pr both produce and legitimize this kind of narcissism. I mean, the a market society says things like self-interest is the ultimate virtue. Uh, civic, civic life, uh, civic courage doesn't matter. The public sphere should be elim eliminated. Everything should be privatized. Wealth should be shifted from the public domain to the private domain. Uh, economics should govern not just simply the economy, but, but all of social life. And I, and I think that when you begin to look at these metrics, you know, around privatization, deregul deregulation, commodification, I mean, what you begin to get is a worldview that is so consistent with the rise of selfies, the commodification of the self, where everything is commodified, that you begin to see that this is not just some sort of marginal kind of movement. This is something that deeply reflects the most central values of a really totalitarian, fundamentalist, market-driven society. Writing in the 1950s, Greek philosopher Cornelius Castoriadis wrote about how privatization caused people to spiral away from one another in loneliness. How do you see this manifesting itself in the age of the selfie? Well, I, I think that what the selfie does is that it does a number of things. One, it reproduces the assumption that the only that that the only element of the social that matters is a kind of self-interest in which the self gets performed. So it's not about engaging in modes of solidarity with other people. It's not about defining agency in collective terms. It's defining agency in very narrow, self-interested terms. And I and I think that works to really undermine both 
any sense of public values. It works to undermine any sense of community. It works to undermine specific notions of solidarity. I mean, selfies are not producing communities. I mean, what they're producing, producing is simply a narcissistic, often performance of the self. Now, there are exceptions to this. I mean, selfie culture, like all cultures, is a site of struggle. I mean, there are some groups that really are actually trying to reassert and narrate themselves in ways that challenge dominant conceptions of them. I mean, disabled people, poor minorities in the United States are saying, hey, look, we really want to represent ourselves and we'll do, with, do this with selfies, but not in a way to sort of shut down conversations and public dialogue, but to open it up. And I think in that sense, there's something going on. But I, but I think that, I, I love Castoriadis. I mean, I think that in his notion of autonomy, you know, I mean, his argument is that what atomization does and it, as a function of capitalism is that it alienates people, it privatizes them, it tells them the self is the only place that they can go. And under neoliberalism, it's worse because it says that all problems are basically individual problems. So we have no way of translating private issues into larger public concerns. If you're homeless, you're homeless because you're stupid. If you're not working, it's because you're lazy. If you're poor, it's because you don't try hard enough. All systemic sort of causes disappear just as public memory disappears, social struggles disappear. And I think that that creates a sense of the self that is so overburdened, so difficult to be able to navigate a world in which there are no systems of support, no social provisions, you know, no safety nets, no public values at work. I mean, that is truly, uh, that truly speaks not just simply to the end of democracy, it speaks to the end, it speaks to an existential crisis that seems enormously difficult to overcome. In light of that, how can we fight the forces of domination? Well, I, I think the thing that we need to recognize is that there are many young people all over the world and many social groups and many political movements, whether we're talking about Podemos in Spain or we're talking about Sirius in Greece or we're talking about what's happening in Latin America, who are redefining the meaning of politics and what that means for the future. Politics no longer means that capitalism equals democracy. That relationship is being challenged and a new kind of politics is emerging. But what I particularly see as interesting is this merging of young people in, into social movements in which they're using uh, the new media to produce all kinds of alternative public spheres that challenge mainstream public spheres, that challenge mainstream self selfie culture, that challenge deregulation, privatization, and commodifications as the central values of social engagement. They're not buying it. And, and, I, and I think this is a very helpful, hopeful, uh, thing to see. Thank you, Henry, for joining me on Imaginary Lines. Oh, thank you for having me. The German television channel ZDF has published a picture accompanying a recent news segment about alleged Russian military presence in eastern Ukraine. The segment featured a photograph of three Russian tanks with the caption, Russian armored vehicles moved through Isvarino in the Lugansk region, February 12, 2015. But the Permanent Open Committee of Media Monitoring, a citizens group, showed the picture was taken in 2009 in South Ossetia, where Russian peacekeeping forces were deployed. This is not the only case in which misleading photos allegedly portraying a Russian invasion of Ukraine have been proven false. In mid-February, U.S. Republican Senator Jim Einhoff revealed what he claimed were photographs showing the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The photo showed a column of Russian tanks in a highway and burned bodies of alleged Ukrainian troops attacked by the armored vehicles. The photos were provided to the senator by Kyiv officials. Hours later, the senator issued a public apology. That's it for today's Imaginary Lines. Thanks for watching the show. I'm your host, Chris Spanos. Please join me next week. Mm -hmm.